Hi guys, Niall here. Welcome back to the 8020 BIM channel. Today we're going to talk about everything related to rooms in Revit and we're going to learn how we can place rooms correctly as well as leverage the reporting parameters of rooms in various manners. The way we're going to approach this tutorial today is we're going to take an empty version of this file here and replicate what I've shown here on screen. In order to do that, we're going to touch on five primary topics. We're going to talk about placing rooms in the first instance, tagging rooms, creating a room color scheme and legend, similar to the one down here and what you're seeing, create a room schedule, as well as reporting parameters, and finally, a few little tips and tricks on dealing with rooms in various use cases. So without further ado, we'll leave this finished product behind and we'll go back into our empty file so that we can start the process. So here we have the empty model. And as you can see, it's not populated in any way uh, similar to the, the completed version. All we have is the spaces. So to start, the first thing you need to know is in order to place rooms within your Revit model, your rooms need a designated boundary to fall within. So as you're looking at this file here, you can see that we have walls placed throughout. And when I select one of these walls, on the left hand side, you can see in the properties dialogs under constraints, we have room bounding. And this has a tick associated to it. This tick means that a room will be enclosed by any walls that state their bounding. If that was turned off and I was to place a room up here, it would span this whole space here rather than just this enclosed space on top. So we're going to leave that active where we want to confine our room within. So in order to see which walls are bounding at a glance, we can go into our architectural tab. Okay. And we're actually going to go into the first step, which is the room placement dialog. So under the architecture tab, if you go and select room, or as you can see on the short key, it says or M, you can see that outside of our model footprint here, you, it states room, not enclosed, not enclosed. This means that there's no bounding walls to enclose this room within. So as you can see on top here, we've got a few options. We can select highlight boundaries. And now you can see every instance of the boundaries of the walls, sorry, that have the boundary condition active within Revit. So we know that, okay, we can place our Revit rooms anywhere in these spaces and they will be enclosed. So that's great. So we can go down to this dialog here at the bottom and press close. As you can see as well, once we place our room within a footprint of bounding walls, it has the tag already visible. So if we do not want the tag visible on placement, we can turn off the tag on placement tab on top. And now it will just place the room. So we're going to leave that on and we're going to start placing our rooms throughout. The next thing to know is that we actually are missing one constraint that will inform our reporting parameters and our schedules later on. And that is we haven't clearly defined the height of the room. And we can actually do that in plan. Up at the top here, you can see that our upper limit is level zero, which is the placement plane, the ground floor essentially that I'm placing the room on. But at the offset, it's set as a default to 4,000. So in this instance, I'm just gonna set that to 2,500. So we know that every room placed on the ground floor is going to be 2,500. And you can alter that from room to room. I can place the first room here at 2,500, and then I can say 3,000, 3, let's say, and place the next room at 3,000, and so on. We can vary the room heights as we progress through the project. This also means that we can control the height independent of a confining ceiling. So if we have a ceiling above and we want to have the room height extend above the ceiling, we can tell it to do so. So that let's say the service zone is still considered part of the room volume. So there might be other use cases for that. So as you can see, we've placed a number of rooms throughout 
and I can select any one of these here and you can see that the boundary is assigned to the bounding walls which have the room bounding ticked. So now we know how we can create our walls so that they're bounding and we can place our rooms within the bounding walls. The next thing we need to know after we have figured out how to do the previous steps including the height um, the height offset is that we need to understand that not all the time are we going to designate a room just by bounding walls. So in this instance here you can see that this is reporting 85 meters squared which is the full footprint here but actually for our use case we want to have a designation down here that is different from the main room. So this is actually a production room and down here we want a little prep area and we want to actually call that up as a prep area. So in order to separate that from the boundary we can actually use a room separator and by selecting the room separator in the architecture tab we can select a line, we can draw a line that depicts the room separator and as you can see the moment I completed that line the area of the boundary changed to match that line. So now I can press RM again and that will allow me to tag that space within that boundary as an independent room. So now that we've done all this we need to talk about room tagging. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to select a few of the tags and I'm going to remove them. As you can see we get a warning after we deleted the tag saying that the room tag was deleted but the corresponding room still exists. That means that we haven't actually removed the room geometry from the project. We have merely removed the reference from the plan. So that room remains present. So that means that we can re-tag this room. So yet again in our architecture tab we can go to tag room or RT for room tag for short and you can see that we can just place our tags over our rooms again without issue. So that is how we place our room tags after our rooms have been placed. Now we, begin, we, now we can begin an exercise where we renumber and relabel our rooms. So here you can select a tag and within the tag itself you can change the reporting labels. So I'm going to select that to one and I'm just going to call this entrance. And here will be two, and we're going to call this canteen. And we can continue to progress through the project as such. So this is going to be a production room. Forgive the typing. Warehouse one. Oh, sorry, you can see I made an error there because I was actually changing the number rather than the room name. So this should be warehouse one. And up here you can see that I've actually changed that number instead. So I actually want that to be number five, and that is to be lab. Okay. So this is six, seven. warehouse 2 and up here this will be room 8 and we're just going to call that distribution. Okay so now we know how to place our rooms, designate the height of the room, use room separators where we don't have dividing walls, create our, place our tags in the plan view that are associated to our room boundaries and now change the naming and numbering of our rooms within our project. So that's all fairly straightforward. From there now, we need to actually figure out how this room tag is working. So as you can see, this is reporting the room number, the room name, and it's also reporting two areas, one in square meters and one in square feet, okay? So just quickly so you can see how this tag is created, I'm gonna go into the edit family, and you can see that when I select this, I can edit the label. Okay, so this label here is reporting the parameter number. Okay, 
this parameter here is name. This label down here is area. And this label down here is also area, but it gives both areas have a different unit assigned to them. So that's quickly how that has been created. What I will do in this video is I'll actually give a download link within the description or maybe through on the blog site so that you can download both the complete and the incomplete versions of this so you can carry out this exercise in the same manner that I've done it. I will also make sure that all of these families are included in the final product so that you can derive the families and edit them as you wish. So now we know how to create loosely our reporting labels for our room tags. Now, it's a bit flat as it stands. We don't really have anything to describe the rooms outside of the names and the numbers. And what's really useful for this kind of thing is if you want to have a better description or isolate different room functions from one another, something like a color scheme is typically applied. And historically in CAD, you'd use a hatch or something to define this. But in this instance, we can actually use something called a color fill legend. And I'm gonna discuss how you can create your color scheme on plan as well as your color fill legend to report the scheme. So to start, on your left hand side, in your properties, you can scroll down and you will see here color scheme. Okay. So under color scheme, it's currently assigned to none, as we can clearly see, but I can select this. And at the top left of this, you'll see category. And the category is broken down into spaces, rooms, and HVAC zones as default. So as we've placed our rooms, we know that we're going to select rooms. And yet again, you will have a couple of options here. You'll have by department, by room number, or color scheme by room name. So here, I'm going to select by room number to give you a first example. And I'm going to press OK. And as you can see, each of the rooms, because they have different numbers, have been given a unique color identifier for your plan so that you can clearly designate each one by color. You can clearly um, understand which one, which function is by color. So what's absent from this here now is actually a key or a legend to describe what we're seeing in plan. So if you go to your annotate tab, under color fill, you will see we have a color fill legend. Once you select that and you move your cursor onto your view, it will automatically pick up the type of color scheme you've applied to the view and will create your legend. As you can see, this isn't very descriptive view. We have our numbers in sequence, but it's, it's not very legible. So I'm actually going to alter the nature of the color scheme. On the left hand side, we're going to go back into our properties and say by room. And I'm going to change the by room to color scheme by room name. And you can see a lot of our colors have updated. Now, some of our colors are very, very bold there. So I'm just going to tone them down a bit. And you can do this very simply. You can select your various colors here and you can tone them down. What's better than this again is that you can also apply some sort of a hatch or fill pattern when you wish as well. So for warehouse two, for example, I could select a fill pattern here and I could say vertical three mil and maybe give that something like a darker tone. And once we press apply, you will see we have solid color fills everywhere else, but in this instance, we have a vertical line hatch pattern, essentially, that's being applied. I'm going to change that back to solid fill. Oh, where's solid fill? Tidy nummy. And I'm going to tone that down again. I might just drag it over elsewhere so we get a different, different tone. I'm going to press apply and okay. Now something interesting here has happened and I haven't seen this before. The actual warehouse two has not updated on plan, but our, <laughs> our legend has, um, the troubles of doing a, a live presentation. Sometimes these things just happen. Okay. So I'm going to go back and
there you go, that fixed it. It just didn't automatically update, even though it should have. I don't really know the reason for that, but at least we know now the solution to that. Um, so now you can see that we've created our by room name legend. And this is brilliant because we have a different color and a key that describes the name associated to each color. So if we wanted, we could hide all room tags and still understand which room was which. So I'm going to undo that, the hidden room tags. So let's just say, for example, we wanted to describe different rooms as the same color because they have different functions. So for example, let's say our entrance here and our canteen, they may be deemed, you know, admin space or staff space. So what you can do once you select the rooms is under identity data, you can go down to department and assign a department. So I'm going to call this admin. Okay. And then I'm going to select these rooms here. And I'm going to call these production. Okay. So under department, we're going to call it production. And then finally, I'm going to select our warehousing. And I'm going to call that storage. And our last room, our distribution, I'm actually going to name distribution also. So now we've actually created, I'm oh sorry, apologies, put that in the wrong field. So now we've actually created four unique departments, but as you can see, we still have the room name by legend. We, we still have the colorized by room name rather than by department. So again, we can go back to our color scheme and we can select under our category rooms by department. And you can see actually I've got multiple um, existing ones that were still in the file. So I'm going to remove production and I'm going to remove that storage there. I'm going to press yes. And once I press apply and okay, you can see that although we have different rooms because they're on the shared department, basically warehouse one and warehouse two are under department storage, they will show the same color because the color scheme depicts that. So I think we'll go back to our room scheme so that it emulates what we had at the start. So now that we know how to create our rooms and place our room tags and create the color scheme and color scheme legend, we now need to know how we can create a schedule that will report all of our room information as we require it. So in order to do this, on the right hand side, if you scroll down your project browser, which is my preferred location to find it, if you right click under schedules and quantities, you can say new schedule slash quantities. And then you can scroll down to rooms. Okay, and you want to ensure that you schedule building components. I also want you to be sure that you select the correct phase of works. This model actually has three phases as the existing phase and two proposed phases of works. So I'm selecting phase two because this behind is set to phase two. So pressing okay. Now we can start to depict what reporting parameters we want to add into our schedule. So first of all, we're gonna start with our number. And secondly, we're gonna start with our name. Okay, so when you select from the available fields on the left hand side and you press the green button to put them into your scheduled fields for your schedule. If you want to remove one, you can press the red button and that will send it back to the available fields. So if you have a link with various rooms that are assigned to the same phase, you can also tell it to include elements and links, but in this instance we don't. So I'm going to press OK. And straight away, you can see that we have a room schedule that reports our room number and our room names. So in order to add that to our sheet, I'm going to go back to our sheet and I am going to drag our room schedule onto our sheet. And I'm just going to place it up here for the moment. So it's very bare bones. It's really reporting what we already have on the sheet, which isn't particularly useful. What we want to do is actually report more of the parameters that the room has identified after its placement. So yet again, I'm going to go back into the room schedule and I can access that by going through the project browser on the right hand side or by double click the room schedule on the sheet. 
I'm going to go back into fields and we're going to add a couple of additional parameters. So I want to add the perimeter so we understand the length of the perimeter of the room. I also want to add the area and the unbounded height. The unbounded height reports the height that we assign to the room on placement. So in this instance, I actually want the unbounded height to be in the schedule before the area. So I don't want the area reading on a column before the unbounded height. I want it the other way around. So we can control that by using this button here. So I can move that parameter up so it becomes higher in the priority from left to right. Yet again, I can move it down if I wanted to go lower in priority. So I'm going to press OK. And as you can see, immediately we have a schedule full of reporting parameters. So we can then go back to our drawing sheet and you will see all of our reporting parameters are there. So there's a little bit of tidying up here that we need to do. Yet again, I'm going to double click. I don't like how it's sequenced incorrectly. So I want to go into the sorting and grouping tab and I want to sort by number ascending. And you'll see that we'll have sequentially numbered. Now we can close that and we have it sequentially on the sheet now. So I want you to pay close attention to the distribution numbers here on the bottom. Because I'm going to grab the wall and stretch it and I want you to look at how the perimeter and the area both update accordingly. So as you can see they both grew as the room grew and this is the strength of the parametric nature of Revit. So that we, once we place the rooms, understand that all of our reporting parameters for the duration of the project will be correct regardless of what shape changes happen to the room. So I'm just going to undo that back to its original. And I'm going to exit that view. So now that we have run through how to place your room, tag your room, create a room color scheme, create a room schedule, I just want to talk about two little tips and tricks uh, that you, don't, you won't inherently know about rooms in Revit. So the first thing to understand about rooms in Revit is this. They do not transcend through phases. So what do I mean by that? I mean that if you assign these rooms on the existing phase and then you put your view to phase one, there'll be no rooms present in phase one. So rooms are one of the few categories that do not move up and down through the phases. Just to show you this, you can see under phasing on the view properties, I have a phase two. I can go back to phase one and you'll see all of the room information has disappeared. And that's because we place, we have to place the rooms per phase. And that, that there's a very simple reason for that. In this space here, for example, there used to be a wall here. The last thing we need is a reporting parameter that only depicts the existing footprint when we need to actually redesignate the room as something else. So although it can be frustrating to place rooms in multiple phases across large projects, it actually means that you can assign new rooms to the same footprint through the phases as well. Another thing to understand is that there is a best practice for deleting rooms from your project. So as we saw earlier, when I deleted the tag, we got this report saying that it was just the tag that was deleted, but the room still remained present. So when I select a room and I delete it, you can see that the room is deleted from all model views, but it still remains in the project. So I haven't actually effectively removed the room from the project. So if I want to place a room here again, you can see it's gone to number nine because it's next in the sequence. But if I change that to number one, it will say elements have duplicate number values. And that's because the room one still exists, even though I deleted it from the model, because it still remains in the project breakdown. So what's the solution to this? So I'm going to undo all the way back using Control Z until our start point there. The best practice for removing rooms from a project is within the schedule. And the way we do that is very simple. If you right click the number cell or a cell on your row of the room that you want to get rid of, you can delete row. 
and that deletes all data associated to that row. So if you have the room placed and the room tag in multiple views, they will all delete across the whole project because you've removed the room in its entirety from the project. So when I press OK and I go back, you can see our, warehouse, our, our entrance room one is now gone. And it's also no longer reporting in our room name legends. And it's gone from our schedule because that's where we removed it from. So I'm just going to undo that so we can finish as we started. So guys, that's pretty much everything you need to know to get started using Rooms in Revit. I have a video just before this one actually, which I will link in the eye in this video, that goes on to show how you can create finishes schedules off of the base room schedule that I've created here. And that really is a, f a use case for when you're in a hurry. I also have another video that shows how to correctly phase projects within Revit using this as the base file, which I will also add to the cards at the end of the video. So as always, thank you for checking out the 8020 BIM channel. If you have any questions, make sure to put them in the comment box below. I'll do my best to answer them. If there's a follow-on video you'd like in a topic related to this, please let me know down there as well. As always, like, comment, subscribe, and I will catch you next time. Thanks guys, so long. Bye-bye.